Hail and welcome, Paul here once again. And as you can see, I'm in a different setting. That is because my fiance and I have moved out of our apartment life into a new home out in the country. And we are enjoying it very much. So the rest of my lectures will be presented here. Anyways, without further ado, in my last lecture, we talked about the grandsons of Charlemagne and how they divided their grandfather's empire into three kingdoms. <clears throat> how the three brothers were often at odds with each other, which inevitably weakened them against attacks from the Vikings and how in 845 after decades of these attacks the Vikings finally struck the heart of West Frankish power in the siege of Paris being led by a famous sea king named Ragnar Lothbrok. Forty years later, in 885, the Vikings once again returned to Paris to finish what they started, this time under a Danish warlord named Siegfried. Siegfried and his Vikings arrived in Paris right before winter with hundreds of ships and possibly tens of thousands of men. Upon their arrival, Siegfried met with the Bishop of Paris, Jocelyn, the first attested fighting bishop in medieval literature. Siegfried made the offer to leave Paris if his fleet would be allowed passage upstream to ravage the French countryside. But Bishop Jocelyn curtly refused in the name of King Charles. This Charles that Bishop Jocelyn invoked was Charles the Fat, the youngest son of Louis the German, King of East Francia. Now, Charles the Fat was born in the year 839, so he would have grown up in a world of dynastic rivalry amongst his father and uncles. There is a supposed incident of demonic possession, which happened in his youth, where it is said he was at the altar of a church foaming at the mouth. This greatly affected him and his father, and could have played a part in his piety. In 859, Charles was made Count of the Breisgau, an Alemannic march in modern-day southwestern Germany. Then in 863, Charles joined in a rebellion against his father, led by his brothers, Carloman and Louis III. They were victorious, and as a result, Carloman received rule over the Duchy of Bavaria. And in 865, Louis the German was forced to divide his remaining land among his two other sons. Louis III received Saxony, Franconia, and Thuringia, and Charles received all of Alemannia, which consisted of Swabia in southwestern Germany into parts of Switzerland. Charles and Louis III were also to divide Lotharingia equally amongst themselves. In 875, 
the emperor and king of Italy, Louis the Younger, son of Lothar, died, having agreed with Louis the German that Carloman would succeed him in Italy. However, the king of West Francia, Charles the Bald, would invade Italy and have himself crowned king and emperor. As a result, Louis the German would send Italian armies under his sons to take the kingdom back. But Charles the Bald would die soon after in 877. Carloman would then be king of Italy until 879 when he fell sick and decided to resign and Charles the Fat ascended to the Italian throne. Two years later, in 881, Pope John VIII had Charles the Fat crowned Emperor of the Romans. Now, West Francia at the time was ruled by two kings the sons of Louis the Stammerer, Carloman II, and a different Louis III. Upon their deaths in 882 and 884, Charles the Fat had conveniently made himself the king of West Francia as well. So not only is Charles the Fat, now Emperor of the Romans, but he has completely reunited the Empire of Charlemagne, which had been fragmented into petty kingdoms by his successors since the death of his son, Louis the Pious, in 840. For the first time, in 44 years, West Francia, East Francia, and Middle Francia were one united empire. However, shortly after Charles the Fat reunited the Carolingian Empire, did those Scandinavian sea raiders we know as Vikings returned to the mighty city of Paris to finish what they had started with Charles' uncle. These Vikings were led by a Danish warlord named Siegfried, who had been denied a bribe and had promptly led a fleet of 700 ships up the Seine perhaps carrying as many as 30,000 or 40,000 warriors, a considerably large host. However, there are some who suggest that this recorded number could be an exaggeration. Now, Paris at the time was located on an island known today as the Ile de la Sete, the island was surrounded by a stone rampart with two bridges on each side of the island, one made out of wood and the other out of stone, each bridge being guarded by a defensive tower. By the standards of the 9th century, the city was impregnable. The Danes initially seemed to have had an advantage over the Franks in that the king was in Italy at the time. It seems that Charles the Fat bit off more than he could chew when he achieved sovereignty over all of Charlemagne's former empire. He could not efficiently manage his empire during the turmoil of the Viking invasions, and the Franks would have to be led by the Count of Paris, Odo. In Count Odo, however, the Danes would be given a run for their money and he would come to fill the void of leadership left open by the failing Carolingian kings. 
it seems that by the late 9th century, going into the 10th century, the Carolingians began to suffer the same fate as the Merovingian do-nothing kings before them in the 7th and 8th centuries as they became weakened by mismanaging their kingdoms with sibling rivalries, external threats, and other factors. And we start to see throughout the rest of the Dark Ages in France, the kings become considerably weak in comparison to the various dukes and counts ruling in the kingdom. Count Odo of Paris being one of them. And with the courageous joint leadership of Count Odo and Bishop Jocelyn, the Vikings would be faced with a force to be reckoned with. The Danes attacked Paris just before the winter of that year, 885. They attacked the city with a number of siege weapons and even tried to undermine the city. But the Franks countered their attack by pouring boiling oil on the invaders. The Danes would continue to attack with battering rams and fire. But Odo and Jocelyn held strong and their forces halted the Viking incursion. Siegfried withdrew his forces after their attacks had failed and they came back strong and the Danes held Paris under siege for the next two months even attempting to fill the river with debris, plant matter, and dead bodies in order to fill it up enough to walk across. They then attempted to burn one of the bridges by sending a burning ship towards it. However, the ship sank before it could reach the bridge. By February of that year, however, the Seine River flooded and the bridge supports gave way. Bishop Jocelyn sent 12 Frankish warriors out to the tower to repair the bridge, but Siegfried saw this and attacked the tower while the Franks back on the ramparts could do nothing but watch. The Danes killed the defenders and burned the wooden tower to the ground. Siegfried was then able to achieve his initial goal, plunder the French countryside. He sent his Vikings to Chartres, La Mans, and Evreux. Count Odo then sent men to Italy to plead with Charles to return to Paris, but Charles refused. Odo would, however, received the aid of Count Henry of Saxony, Charles' main German ally. Henry's army, however, would be weakened by marching during the winter, and they only made one successful attack. By the time spring came, disease began to spread, and Bishop Jocelyn fell dead. Odo then slipped away out of besieged territory to petition for Charles's help, which Charles eventually agreed to. He marched to Paris alongside the armies of Henry of Saxony. By summer, the Vikings had made a final attempt to take the city, but the imperial army halted their attack. However, Henry had fallen into one of the ditches that the Vikings had dug up and was captured and killed and a fatigued Charles was not willing to lose any more men and opened negotiations with Siegfried. He granted the Vikings permission to sail up the Seine to ravage Burgundy. By doing this, Charles felt he could weaken the Burgundians into submission. However, 
the people of Paris were outraged that Charles would send a heathen attack on fellow Christians. Charles would further tarnish his reputation by paying Siegfried a Danegeld of 700 pounds of silver. Charles died in 888, and he would forever be remembered as the Frankish king who reunited Charlemagne's empire only to fail miserably at defending it against the Vikings. Before he died, the East Franks deposed him, and his nephew Arnulf of Carinthia would be elected king of East Francia, and Arnulf would prove himself to be a formidable leader. Charles would then retire to an estate in the Black Forest where he would die alone. After his death, Burgundy, Italy, and Provence would elect their own rulers. And the West Franks would elect Odo as their king, who would go on to turn the tide of the Viking Age in France. In Odo, a new dynasty would come into being, the Robertians, named after Odo's father, Robert the Strong. And going into the 10th century, dynastic rivalry between the Carolingians and Robertians would come to a head, as the Carolingians would grasp at straws to hold what little power they still had. These disputes would occur all while the Vikings still fought to besiege the kingdoms of the Franks. In time, the Vikings would come to be led by a new warlord, one who would not only shift the balance of power in northern Francia, but whose descendants would completely alter the course of history throughout the remaining centuries of the Middle Ages. But that is a story for next time. Salute.